Chapter 23, Modern Industry and Mass Politics, from 1870 to 1914. And just the very name, as you know, this is going to be a very interesting chapter. One of my biggest complaints about any textbook that we have, I happen to be one of these people who uh, believe in something being linear. When you start out at 1870 and you go to 1914, in my mind, you should include everything that happened in 1914. We were going to go all the way to 1914, which begins in World War I, and in Chapter 24, is going to skip back. And we're going to go through uh, imperialism. Nuts. It happened before the war. So let's get started on this really interesting chapter. We've got, in this chapter, we're going to be introduced to what you call a radically new world because we're going to have a second industrial revolution. And of course, that's going to create demands in the political area. There's going to be scientific investigations that are going to challenge all the liberal assumptions about human nature. We're going to hear uh, things like why we are the way we are, uh, you know, from Freud and the other psychologists. Our artists and writers are going to develop new forms of expression, which we go from being able to look at a painting and being able to tell what it is to looking at a painting and it's supposed to invoke feelings because it's full of dots and dashes and crazy symbols. Uncertainty. What aspects of the past are we going to continue to be relevant? Are we going to continue to com improve, as they say, and uh, all these new crazy ideas that we have? It just seems to be a time of, like I said, uncertainty. We're not real sure which way we're going to go. And a lot of it's going to depend on where you live. If you live out in the rural area, you're going to be very contented with being the same as you've always been. But if you live in the towns, you're going to want to change and want all this new things that's going on. We're going to have new technologies, which doesn't affect everybody, but it's going to affect production. It's going to affect the workers. In 1850s and 1870s, uh, just 20 short years, the cost of producing steel is going to decrease rapidly. And the steel industry is going to be dominated, of course, by Britain, followed by Germany and a rapidly improving Americas. Of course, we're going to have electricity and alternating and transforming products. High voltage alternating current is going to be established. And Edison is going to invent the incandescent light filament lamp. In 1879, which is going to really make a lot of changes, not only in the towns, but in your home life, in the, in the factories. And because of this, the new technology is going to transform industry and manufacturing. So this second industrial revolution is going to be centered on steel, electricity, and chemistry. First with steel. Steel is stronger and more malleable than iron, and the new processes that have been invented are well, makes the process speed up, makes it a little bit cheaper to do, and it has a major impact on European navies. And in this case, the navies we're referring to are actually people who get on board a ship and wear uniforms. And the new nation of Germany is benefiting graciously from these developments. Electricity, as we said, Edison creates an incandescent filament lamp. It's going to improve our home life. You're going to find, now be able to work 24 hours a day because you're going to have lights in the factories. You're not going to work just from daylight to dawn. You're going to have street lights in the cities. It's going to make it safer to walk at night. You're going to have lights in your home. You're going to be able to go out to eat and not have to have the kerosene smell or see candle light. You're going to have electricity. And water power was used to create electricity over large distances. And like I say, it's going to transport not only your life, but the way you live in the cities is transportation. You're going to have electric streetcars. It's going to be wonderful. No longer after the horse-drawn carts that where the car, the horses actually, shall we say, eliminate their waste in the middle of the street because with a electrical uh, subway car or something like this, you won't have the waste in the middle of the street. It's going to alter urban or city living as well as life in all homes. And the reason I've got the question marks there is because it's not going to alternate, I mean alter all homes. It's going to be primarily the homes in the city and the suburbs. The annual amount of steel from 1879 to 1913 had just tremendously increased. Britain, Germany, France, Russia, as well as the Americas. And of course, we have chemicals. We now have an effective production of alkali and sulfuric acid, which is going to transform the manufacture of paper, soaps, textiles, and fertilizer. Of course, Great Britain is going to lead the way in soaps and cleaners and in mass marketing. And what reminds me of Britain leading the way in the manufacture of soaps. You've heard the expression, get off your soapbox. 
the soap was shipped in wooden boxes. And since we didn't have any microphones or anything yet, if you're going to speak to a crowd, you don't want to stand up and be have your head above the crowd so your voice will carry. And people used to carry wooden soap boxes with them so they could stand up on them and be higher than the uh, audience. German production focused on industrial uses such as synthetic dyes and refining petroleum, which is a new textile industry. Not textile, but new industry. And liquid fuel internal combustion engines. Oh, yeah. By 1914, most navies the kind that float on ships, have converted from a coal engine to oil, which is going to make them faster. And protecting these new oil fields is going to become a state prerogative, an imperative prerogative. It's going to create potential for worldwide industrialization because there's oil everywhere. Of course, there's oil, more oil in certain areas than others, which we're discovering about this time. The industrial regions of Europe, and if you'll notice, uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, the Balkan nations, Russia, they're not industrialized. You've got England and France and Germany and parts of other countries, but just small areas. But technolo technological changes are going to create changes in scope and scale of industry. And technology is going to be the cause and consequence of the race toward a bigger, faster, cheaper, and more effective world. You see the rise of heavy industry and mass marketing. You're going to see national mass, mass cultures where ordinary citizens could follow and see what's going on. On You could be living in London and know what's going on in Europe. You could be living in Russia and know what's going on in the United States just by the new technological ways. And Europe's going to divide the globe and enlarge their empires with engineering mastery. But there's going to be a lot of changes in Europe, not just in Great Britain. Population is going to grow constantly because we've got no more food shortages. The populations are less susceptible to illness and they're like the black pig and things because you get lower infant mortality where babies are living. We're also going to see fewer children per child, per family. There's going to be advances in medicine, nutrition, and personal hygiene. You're going to learn that these things all work together to keep you healthier. And there's going to be improved housing and sanitation. You're going to see sewage put in, running water put in, so people no longer have to carry water with a bucket and use a, what we used to call before a chamber pot and then throw it out the window next morning. But consumption is going to be the center of economic activity and theory in the department store and the middle class. Oh, yes. I remember the first time I saw a department store, and it was probably about the time your grandparents were alive. It was a famous bar in St. Louis. And the whole store was one entire block big and four stories high. I mean, you could spend a week in there and not see everything. The first floor was usually full of restaurants and things like this to entertain you, and then the other you know, a whole floor devoted to linens, a whole floor devoted to men's wear and women's wear. It was just phenomenal. And, of course, we didn't know we needed these things if we hadn't read about them in the paper or newspaper or magazines. And if, even if we didn't have the money, we've got credit now. You can dollar down a dollar a week, per se. So you've got new patterns of consumption, uh, which were largely urban. Uh, out in the counties in the country, they still were, you know, living in the olden days where if you didn't have the money, you didn't order something. Uh, traditional habits or views about purchases and debt. You didn't want to be in debt. But if you were on a farm, really, you know, your livelihood depended on the weather, and you never knew from today to tomorrow what the weather's going to be like next year, so you better be prepared. But economic growth and mass consumption are going to spur a reorganization of the capitalist institutions. And we begin to see not just the locally owned business, but in large modern corporations. And they're going to protect society from boom and bust, they say. But doing this, we're going to have monopolies. And these two words in red, you do need to know the meaning of them. They did this by vertical integration, which industries controlled every step of the production. For instance, uh, you would own a coal mine, you would own a railroad train to, to uh, transport the coal, you would own a place to do whatever you want to do to the coal, make it into something else, or the distribution process. of you, you owned everything from beginning to end of that product, whether it was making salt, whether it was uh, the oil factories, I mean, the oil companies are, no matter what it was, from beginning to end. And you'd think that vertical integration, because, you know, that's straight up and down, that sounds more like one company. But no, that would be horizontal. Horizontal is when you consolidate everything that makes one item. For instance, uh, salt manufacturing. You owned every store that produced and sold salt. You didn't own anything else. So the same industries are going to band together. And this took place in America and Germany more so than any other country. 
in Brit Great Britain, they had free trade, and in France, they had a lot of family firms. But in America and Germany, consolidation through vertical integration, owning everything that you manufacture from beginning to end, or horizontal alignment when you had uh, just everything in that one particular field. But the dominant trend was to increase cooperation between government and industry. Ah, so. So laissez-faire is not going to be operating here. We want the government to set rules to help us, like break strikes and things like that. And the appearance of businessmen and financiers as officers of the state, unelected officers of the state. Because if they owned a big factory, they produced something that the country really needed. They had a lot of power. Even though they were unelected, they could control the way things were doing. The search for markets, goods, and influence. It's going to influence the imperial expansion. Because it doesn't take long to run out of... Uh, natural resources where you're living. You need people who are going to buy the goods that you're producing because you're producing more goods than your own people can consume. So you've been to see this worldwide system of manufacturing, trade, and finance. And of course, using the gold standard worldwide facilitated world trade. And most European countries were importing more than they exported, and this creates an imbalance of trade. But they relied on the invisible exports, such as shipping and insurance and banking, to make up the difference. And of course, London is going to become the seat of the banking capital of the world. The relationship between Europe manufacturing nations and overseas sources of materials was, well, a little iffy because the Europeans had come to expect certain foods at their table. They wanted fresh vegetables. They wanted fresh fruits. And sometimes these things were not available in England or Germany, so you wanted them to come in from Asia and other places. And while whole regions of Africa and Latin America and Asia are producing strictly for the European market. There's also changes in the European working class. Because for the most part, most of the people who were working in factories, they resented all this corporate power. I mean, it seems like we're working our tails to the bone and we just have the same wage and the guy that owns the flat, I mean, he's just getting richer and richer and richer. So we come up with something called the new unionism, and there's going to be changes in the national political structure because of it. About this time, we started hearing words from Karl Marx. He published his first volume of Das Kapital in 1867. In the Marxist Appeal, this is a very short YouTube uh, telling you just a little bit about Karl Marx and socialism. And as usual, it's going to take a good 30 seconds for it to come up. My lectures would be a lot shorter if we didn't have to wait so long for YouTubes. Yuck, yuck. Asian orange chicken, that sounds good. But we're not going to have that. We're going to sit here and watch a little dot move around until it decides it's going to do something. Ugh. Okay, forty five seconds. In the nineteenth century, Europe, Europe underwent, underwent something, something called, called the Industrial, Industrial Revolution. Revolution. The Industrial Revolution had a tremendous impact and influence on the economy of Europe at that time. However, not all good came of the Industrial Revolution. The working class in Europe suffered from many forms of exploitation in order to get the most out of them. Traditional rules and protections went out the window in the new factories that were made. Women and children were absorbed in the workforce because they were considered cheaper. Living standards and education levels dropped in some areas due to the inhumane working conditions. This new system was looked at as glorifying greed while impoverishing the common people. Some began to argue that this system needed radical reform. These were the early socialists. The socialists believed in a democratically controlled economy run for the benefit of all. Their main ideals were equality, cooperation, democracy, and shared prosperity. The unrestrained competition of capitalists should be replaced by cooperation and the business cycle replaced by planned stability. 
The socialists often believed that private ownership of industry and land should be abolished and that property should be shared in common. Many 19th century socialists rejected the idea that the rich deserved their wealth, but rather believed that wealth was created by the working class and was wrongfully attained by the rich. Perhaps the most famous and esteemed socialist thinker to come out of the 19th century was Karl Marx. Marx, unlike other socialists, was a realist. Although Marx was never really noticed for his work during his lifetime, his social, economic, and political ideas gained rapid acceptance in the socialist movement after his death in 1883, especially in the Russian Revolution with Lenin. Marx devoted part of his life to the study of history and made an interesting prediction. His prediction that the, was that the present mode of production, industrial capitalism, would eventually fall and be replaced by communism. Back then, communism was only considered an advanced form of socialism and not the type of communism we think of today. Unfortunately, contrary to his goal, Marx's ideas were used to promote dogmatism and intolerance. Followers of Marx, called Marxists, have claimed that Karl Marx was blamed unfairly for the regimes of rulers like Lenin, Stalin, and Mao, and that his true social ideas were never truly tried out. The idea of a social revolution had somewhat fallen off, but most of our societies today have many socialist elements in them that came up during the 19th century. Socialist beliefs and the beliefs of Marx continue to influence us today as well. You know, when you get right down to it, what it reminds me of is when you look at the true tenets of socialism, they don't have a lot of bad stuff. There's some good points there. It's... it's it's kind of like when you look at the Muslim religion. If you look at the true Muslim religion, it's a beautiful religion, but people have taken it and used it for their own personal benefits and the jihads and things, and this is not in the original Quran. It's just like socialism. Uh, it has a lot of valid to it. I mean, yes, uh, the man is getting richer and richer off of the work of your back. It's, it's kind of like the workers who work in a factory or work in a... Uh, a uh, office today. And yes, things have changed a great deal in the last 15 years, but prior to this time, you say you're not getting paid for what you do, but you don't realize that your boss is paying for your unemployment insurance and he's paying for half of your social security. And before the last few years, he was actually paying for most of all or part of your insurance. So you were getting almost as many benefits unpaid as you were getting in your paycheck. Of course, cost of insurance has gone up and things have changed a great deal. But, uh, before you condemn Marxism and, and communism, and I mean, look at the true tenets of it. You no, know, I personally do not adhere to it. But when you look at the way it was set up, and like he, the young man just pointed out, he has never been tried truly because with Marx and, and you've got Lenin and you've got Khrushchev and all those people in Russia and Chinese and in China, you know, it, it's just not a true communist nature. When you've got secret police and you've got one man in charge, and it, this is not true socialism back to the workers' movement. Of course, there was divisions among the people working. There were people who wanted to do things gradually. There were people who wanted to do things real fast. They were anarchists. They wanted to get rid of the government totally. And then there was the first meeting of the International Working Men's Association. And there were the Marxist parties founded in Germany, Belgium, Austria, France, and Russia. And yes, most of these people were dirt poor. They had nothing to lose. They just wanted a piece of the pie. They were disciplined, politicized, and they worked the workers' organization in these countries. When they, they, they didn't want it true, they wanted to be the leader of it. And they were aimed at seizing control of the state for revolutionary change. So, oh, we don't need to, this is just a repeat of what I just said. And I thought I had deleted this. Uh, don't bother watching it. It's exactly the same thing as the one we just saw. The spread of the socialist parties. Uh, the model of all socialist parties was from Germany, the German Social Democratic Party, the SPD, founded in 1875. And initially, it was trying to get some political change within Germany's parliamentary system. They were going to change the government. 
They radicalized by Bismarck's oppressive anti-socialist laws. We tried to do things right, and that's going to work because Bismarck's in control. But before World War I, the Social Democrats in Germany were the best organized workers' party in the world. They had a rapid expansion of industrialization, a large city working class, and a national government very hostile to organized labor. So you can see the beginnings of the potential for a problem. In Great Britain, the Socialist Party was very small, uh, even though it was a very industrialized economy, because the Labor Party was in control and they remained moderate and committed to incremental reform. So you get a reform today and you might get another reform next week or something. So you can see things are going to happen. So there's no point in, well, the English people just don't get really wound up too fast, too hard. Anarchism. It's similar to Marxism, but they had a different approach to the changes they wanted. They opposed any centrally organized economics and politics. They wanted small, localized democracy. But during the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881, well, they realized that uh, sometimes terror could spark a popular revolt. Syndicalism. That's not how you say that. Syndicalism. 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 They didn't call for terror, but rather strikes and sabotage by the workers. And the capitalist state they thought should be replaced by the workers' syndicate, syndicates or trade organization. But they refused to participate in politics, which they felt limited their, their power to some point, because unless you've got a say in the government, or people are talking, you know, like the uh, people who go to government and talk and not elected. But somebody's got to talk to somebody. You can't just sit back in the dark and not know what's going on or put forth your ideas. But there was limited success. Go by 1895, the European Socialist Parties had roughly 25% of votes. And the Socialist Parties never gained full worker support because some remained loyal to their old traditions or their old religion. Others were excluded because of the definition of the working class as a male industrial worker. German revisionists even questioned Marx's Marx core assumptions. Edward Bernstein called for a shift to a modern reform. The German radicals, like Rosa Luxemburg, well, she called for mass strikes wanting to ignite a proletarian revolution. So conflicts over strategy and tactics reached its climax just before World War I. At the same time, we're having women stand up. By 1884, in Germany, France, and Britain had enfranchised most men, but women, well, we were still second-class citizens. But they began to press their interests through independent organizations and forms of direct action. We had women's rights groups, an organization such as the General German Women's Association, and they were pressing for educational and legal reforms. In Great Britain, women had won the right to control their own property, so when they got married, their husband didn't automatically get everything, and if they got a divorce, they could keep their own property. In France and Germany, women won the right to divorce their husbands, which had never happened before. Men could divorce a woman, but not vice versa. But after these gains, suffrage or voting became the next logical step, they thought. So votes for women became, well, the only way we were going to ever obtain what they call personhood, be identified as an individual instead of a second-class citizen. And, of course, the middle-class women's society multiplied, and this was all middle-class and upper-class. Feminist socialists like Clara Seaton and Lily Rahm believed only society revolution, social revolution, could free the women. Some writers, like French writer Guy, commented from the nationalist and anti-Semitic right wing, but in violence, and this is what's so funny, the men don't run up ties up to violence this very fast in England, but the women just seem to mm, take a bite out of the apple. Millicent Fawcett and the National Union of Women's Suffrage Organizations in 1895, all these women are going to get violent. Emmeline Plankhurst and the Women's Social Political Union. And every time they would demonstrate or burn someone's house or throw rocks or something, the government would come back with violence and severe repression. There was a six-hour riot between suffragette police and bystanders in 1910, and it just seemed like the nation who was supposed to be the epitome, shining example of, uh, you know, class and advancement. And you've got women fighting in the streets with men. And, of course, the Emily Wilding Division lost her life there. They had this idea that uh, 
arrest women when they did something bad and put them in jail. And if they go on a hunger strike, they would try to force feed them with a hose. And if that didn't work, they would release them to let them go home. And as soon as they got the feeling better, they'd go get them and bring them back. Or they would arrest them and put them in a sane asylum or chain them to the beds. Uh, they were always doing something to try to humiliate the woman to get them to give up the fight. But the campaign for women's suffrage helped redefine the Victorian gender roles because women are becoming increasingly more visible. You get more and more middle class women at work. You've got more and more women who they want to be in politics and they want to work in reform. So actually we're developing what we call a new woman. Not quite the new woman we had in the United States, but a new woman in Europe nevertheless. She's demanding an education and she's demanding the education to give her something to help her get a job. And she opposed the chaperones that were always having to go with a young woman who went on a date and what we call the antiquated fashion. And of course, the example given here is corsets. Women were still wearing hard, flailed bone corsets and long petticoats and long, oh, it was just terrible. I don't know how the world women ever survived. They claimed the right to be physically and intellectually active. So there began to be an image of the new woman. And of course, you know who's going to be opposed to this. It's not exclusively male, surprisingly. It's going to be some women who just don't think this is the right place for the woman to do or be. or It's just not the right thing to do. A woman's role is to be a wife and mother. She's not supposed to vote. She's not supposed to be out in public. Of course, this is from the women who, in the cities, who predominantly, they have money. Their husband has position. Uh, if you're out in the county or the country, uh, well, the husband's still the mainstay of the house. But the flashpoint for European anxieties altogether was over labor, politics, gender, and biology. Now, in U.S. history, we call these cultural conflicts. Liberalism and its discontents, yeah. At the turn of the century, the late 19th century liberalism, middle class liberals found themselves on the defensive because mass politics upset the balance between the middle class interests and their traditional, traditional elites. Trade unions, socialists, and feminists are all beginning to challenge the governing class in Europe. And of course, the government's response was a mixture of conciliation and repression. What's really going to be required is a distinctly modern form of mass politics, but they haven't accepted this yet. In France, oh, guess what? The Third Republic and the Paris Commune. Now, after the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 and a humiliating defeat for France, the government of the Second Empire collapsed and we have a Third Republic. There's a new constitution, the triumph of democratic and parliamentary principles, but we have class conflicts, we have scandals in the government, and we are getting a new form of right-wing politics. For instance, the Paris Commune. It's kind of similar to the communes back in the revolutionary days where they're pitting the entire nation of France against the radical part of the city of Paris. Because the people in Paris refused to surrender to the Germans during this Franco-Prussian War. And Paris proclaimed itself to be the true government of France. So the government sent troops into Paris in March of 1871 to settle the issue once and for all. And most of the commune supporters were workers, so it actually became a class war. But 25,000 of these people were executed, killed in fighting, or consumed in fires that they themselves had set. It was not nice. And then there's the Dreyfus Affair. If you haven't, I don't know if you, I'm sure you've already decided on what you're going to write on by now, but if you ever have a chance to read about it, it's, it's very interesting. The new form of radical right-wing politics, uh, such as nationalists, anti-parliamentary, anti-liberal, and anti-Semitic. And anti-Semitism is nothing new. It's been around since there have been Jews. The Dreyfus Affair took place in 1894. And Dreyfus was a man in the military. He had a good rank. He had a good reputation. He'd never done anything wrong. But he was arrested and convicted of selling military secrets to Germany and was deported to Devil's Island in 1896. Of course, the documents were found out very shortly after that they, the ones they used to convict him were forgeries. But the War Department refused to grant a new trial. And there's a whole big stink about it. A lot of people writing about it. Emily Zola backed up Dreyfus and wrote about it. Nationalists and Catholics opposed Dreyfus because he was Jewish, you know. But the man is innocent. 
Now, the anti-Semitism in politics began to merge into three strands of anti-Semitism. You had the anti-Semitic newspaper. Dreyfus got freed in 1899 and was cleared of all charges by 1906. But look how long it took. But as a consequence, the right-wing anti-Semitism spread all over Europe. The mayor of Vienna was even elected on an anti-Semitic platform. And Russian secret police forged something called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Now, what is Zionism? Now, this is Theodore Herzl's definition. Now, he considered the Dreyfus affair to be an expression of a fundamental problem. Yeah. He endorsed Zionism, which was not a feeling or an action. It was the fact that you wanted to build a separate Jewish homeland for the Jews outside of Europe. And Zionism was a modern nationalist movement. And something called the State of Jews was written in 1896. And it actually convened the first Zionist Congress in Switzerland in 1897. There was a lot of enthusiastic support from Jews all over, especially in Eastern Europe. And the demand for a homeland for the Jews in the Middle East is going to grow during the turmoil of the First World War and not be settled until after the Second World War. This is just a picture of the Jewish migration in the late 19th century. They're going everywhere. They're leaving their homeland and moving as far away as they can. Meanwhile, Germany has been unified now, thanks to the Iron Chancellor, and she's searching for imperial unity. She wants to be a big dog on the porch, too. Bismarck had united Germany under the banner of Prussian conservatism. But there were fault lines, as they say, in the political landscape, because there was a divide between Catholics and Protestants. And there was that growing socialist democratic party, and the divisive economic interests of agriculture versus industry. Cultural comp or cultural struggle was Bismarck's anti-Catholic campaign, but it kind of backfired on him because the Catholic center won seats in the Reichstag or the, the government parliament. So Bismarck responded by forcing fashioning a new coalition, agricultural and industrial interests, as well as some socially conservative Catholics. Social Democrats is seen as the new enemies of the state. So Bismarck passed laws that were anti-socialist laws and he began to expel socialists from all the major cities in Germany. He used the social welfare as a carrot to workers. Now, I don't know if you've heard the expression carrot stick. You use a carrot to entice and a stick to hit them if they don't go after the carrot. Sickness and accident insurance, factory inspections, limited working hours and pensions for the elderly. That's the carrot. It became the prototype for all the Western nations, including the United States. But it didn't win the loyalty of workers as they had hoped it would. So William II suspended the anti-socialistic legislation in 1890, it only lasted two years, and legalized the Socialist Democratic Party. Okay, now let's go to Britain for a little while. Don't you love the way we jump around from country to country? The second reform bill, as I mentioned before, extended suffrage to one-third of the adult males, but these were one-third of the adult males for the people who were farmers. So we're consolidating the cities and the farmer land to get rid of the people we don't want to be in the, around in our politics. So liberal and conservative political parties vied to win support of these new, new voters, but the new laws responded to voter concerns, such as elementary education for all children. Now, you're being introduced to two men here who will become very dominant in English politics by the end of the century. Benjamin Disraeli, a conservative Jew, and William Gladstone, a liberal. And they were both very English, very gung-ho for England. But meanwhile, the working, class, the working class moves left of the Liberal Party. And the Labor Party brought together trade unions and middle-class socialists. 1906, welfare legislation was a response by the Liberal Party to pressure from the left of labor. David Lord George, who was the prime minister at the time, he issued a budget of 1909, but there were going to be some problems. Now let's go to Russia for a little while. Internal conflicts and an autocratic political system. Wow, wow, unusual. They were threatened by the Western industrialization and Western political doctrines. They, they feel like being closed in on. Now, Russian industrialization was heightened to social tensions. And the legal system, well, there was no recognition of trade unions or employees association. And they had very outdated banking and finance laws. 
that we're going to have some problems. And they don't have a loyal upper class party either. Alexander II liberated the serfs. His son steered the country toward the right and away from Western Europe. He wanted to have Russia do her things on her own. Nicholas II, who's going to be desired through the uh, World War I, he continued the counter-reforms and programs and opened was open anti-Semitic. He was very much anti-Semitic. As a matter of fact, his wife was the granddaughter of uh, Queen Victoria, not that it matters. The populist, Russia wanted to modernize on its own terms, not those of the West. That's, that's okay, I understand that. They envisioned an elite egalitarian Russia based on the ancient village commune system. They were mostly middle class students and women, about 15% of the population. And then there's a Russia, Russian Marxism that was created by the same tensions from the industrialization in the West, but they organized itself into the Social Democratic Party. But crisis in the leadership ends it in 1930. And you have two words here, the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. You need to remember those two words, even though they're not in red. The Bolsheviks was the majority group. The Mensheviks was the minority group. The Social Democratic Party split. The Bolsheviks, the majority group, called for a centralized party organization of active revolutionaries. They wanted rapid industrialization. They did not want to have to follow the Marxist socialism. They believed they could skip the stage of working for capital, liberal capitalist reforms to create a socialist state immediately. And the Mensheviks, the minority group, they said, you know, let's, not such a bad idea, but let's do it gradually. And they were reluctant to depart from the Marxist orthodoxy. But they finally gained control of the Social Democratic Party. Meanwhile, Lenin, who was in exile a lot of times in Mexico, He's the leader of the Bolsheviks, the Bolsheviks of the majority group. He also was in contact during this time. The Germans knew where he was and they were helping him. They co he coordinated the socialist movement of the Bolsheviks who formed splinter groups all over the country. Now, the first Russian revolution happened back in 1905 and, and because of the Russian Japanese war, which they lost. The rapid industrialization had transformed Russia kind of unevenly and Low grain prices were resulting in peasant uprising. You can't afford to buy a loaf of bread. Then you've got student radicalism. And Russia's regime, their czars are just totally ineffective. So the radical workers organized strikes and demonstrations. On January the 22nd, 1905, over 200,000 marched to St. Petersburg under the uh, auspice of a Catholic priest, Father Capon, and demonstrated at the Winter Palace. Well, you know, the, they're not going to have this. The Tsar orders palace guards to shoot, and 130 were killed, and hundreds were wounded. So, I guess you'd say a reaction. Uh, the protests grew, and merchants began closing stores, and factory owners shut down factories, and lawyers refused to hear cases, and the autocracy lost control of entire towns and regions. So, Nicholas VII, being a broad-minded man as he is, issued something called the October Manifesto, because it was issued in October. He moderately liberal franchise for the election of the Duma, which was the Russian legislature. But he just didn't understand that you need more changes than just a small change in the, in the legislature. But then, <laughs> just a year later, two years later, Nicholas revoked the promises he'd made in October. So the people for the Duma were elected indirectly on class basis, which weakened their power and popular appeal. I didn't have anything to do with him getting elected. He got elected because he was rich. Social reforms came in the years prior to First World War, and agricultural reforms allowed the sale of five million acres of royal lands to the peasants so they could have some of their own land. Labor unions were actually legalized, and there was a few industrial worker reforms, but damn few. Meanwhile, we're going to leave Russia and go to the Ottoman Empire. So what I said, back to 1699. The Ottoman Empire had been in control of the Mediterranean for almost 400 years. But by the late 19th century, the European empires were expanding while the Ottoman Empire was declining. You've got rising nationalism to begin to divide the Ottoman Empire because you've got so many little small countries in there. You had uprisings in Bosnia, Herzegovina, Bulgaria. Then you had the Treaty of Berlin. The great powers intervened to prevent Russia from coming in. 
because Russia would like nothing better than to get in there and get that Black Sea and the warm water ports. Belisario went to Russia, Thessaly to Greece, Bosnia and Herzegovina fell under Austrian control, Montenegro, Serbia, and Romania became independent nations. Well, maybe it's going to work. Then they lost control of North Africa in the late 19th century when Britain occupies Egypt, Italy annexes Tripoli, and France creates protectorate over Morocco. Then there was the independent king of Bulgaria. Austria, since being borrowed from the ancient empire lands in northern central Europe, looks to southeast Europe to grow her lands. So she annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina. Meanwhile, the Turks, especially the educated young Turks, had grown impatient with the weakness of the Sultan. And they got to do something about this. We don't like this. This is pretty much what we call the Balkans, which I've never understood why it's called the Balkans, because the Balkan Sea is way north. We should be called the Adriatic, because that's the Adriatic. You've got the Adriatic Sea. Where's my mouth? There you go. Of course, where, where am I? Here I am. Oops, didn't do that. Of course, you've got Italy, you got Switzerland, you got the German Empire, but look how big the Austrian Hungarian Empire is. This is all, not all one country, there's lots of little bitty countries in here. And then along through here, you've got Herzegovina, Macedonia, Bulgaria, Romania. The old Ottoman Empire is shrinking and shrinking. Meanwhile, with all this stuff going on in politics and in the industrialization, we're going to have a upheaval in the world of ideas. Because science had affirmed during the liberal area of the country that uh, liberal faith was in the power of human reason. But the late 19th century scientific developments defied these expectations, and artists and intellectuals also began to challenge conventions. There was Darwin's theory, a revolutionary theory. Organic evolution by natural selection transformed the conception of nature itself. And what does that mean? So an unsettling new picture of human biology, behavior, and society began to emerge. A person named John Lamarck, he said behavioral changes could alter physical characteristics within a single generation, and that these new traits that had been developed could be passed on to the offspring. Hmm. Well, think about that for a minute. Darwin wrote The Origin of the Species, of course, and he theorized the variations within a population made certain individuals better adapted for survival. He also used natural selection to explain the origin of a new species. And he applied the plant theory to human and animal species as well as to man. He said the human race had evolved from an ape-like ancestor. Of course, his theory was challenged very much so by the religious community. For Darwin, the world was not governed by order and divine will, but by random chance. Now, a man named Thomas Henry Huckley was his bulldog, so to speak. He was always defending him and speaking out for his theory. Then we have another thing come up called social Darwinism. We got this new disciplines of psychology and psychology and anthropology and economics, all applying scientific analysis. It was a man named Herbert Spencer that coined the expression survival of the fittest and condemned collectivism in favor of free competition. He applied individual competition to classes, races, and nations. Actually, the, the theory behind social Darwinism, it, it seemed, once it got into the popular vocabulary, it was a little bit easier to understand, and it justified the, quote, natural order, unquote, of the rich and the poor. It also rationalized the imperative of having imperialism and warfare. And also tied to theories of racial hierarchy and white supremacy. Gee, thought that was just in the United States, didn't you? Ironically, it was also the basis for reform campaigns to improve health and welfare. Now, that's not the only thing good I can see coming out of this. But the irrational and animalistic side of human nature. They say if you scratch us deep enough, the humanistic, the animalistic side of your nature will show. Ivan Pavlov. He performed a series of experiences with exper experiments with the dog to see about training response to stimuli. And of course, his famous experiment with the bell and a dog, a challenging behaviorism. He could ring the bell after a while, and the dog would go for food. If you didn't ring the bell, you could put the food down, and he wouldn't eat it. 
Frederick Nietzsche. Oh, I hope you people have had your Nietzsche's pills. The assault on the values of rationality. He said, middle class culture is dominated by illusions and self-deceptions. The Burgenoid faith in science, progress, and democracy is just nothing more than a futile search for the truth. He did not like Judeo-Christianity morality. He said it instilled a repressive conformity. And the themes of personal liberation, in other words, this Superman. <laughs> I never did get along with Nietzsche. And then, of course, there's Sigmund Freud, which I have problems with, too. He said behavior is largely motivated by the unconscious and irresistible irrational forces. The unconscious drives and desires conflict with the rational and moral conscious. And this is true. We go into a bank vault and we see all this money laying there and we know we're not supposed to take it because it's against the law, but oh, it would be so tempting to pick up that money and go home, wouldn't it? The psyche. Freud's psyche was divided into three parts and you do need to know these three parts. The id was the undisciplined desire for pleasure and gratification. The superego super was the conscious conditioned by morality and culture. And the ego was the area where the conflict between id and the superego is worked out. Hmm. So he said it fed a growing anxiety over the value and limits of human reason. So, you know, I don't really understand this. They're thinking, I, I know better, yet I want to do it. And there's an area that they're fighting out, the good and the bad, like these commercials. they got an angel on one side and a devil on the other pushing me. One's the id and one's the super ego. And the ego is where they're going to do their fight. Hmm. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church and most of all religions are on the defensive. Pope Pius IX wrote something called the Syllabus of Eras, where he condemned materialism, free thought, and relative, religious relative, relative, relativism. He convoked his first church council since the Catholic Reformation. And of this, it was produced the theory of popal infallibility was declared. And of course, it was denounced by most Catholic governments because the Pope, no matter how you look at it, even though he is God's chosen descendant, he is a human being. And as such, he has the potential to make mistakes. Pope Leo XIII acknowledged that there is good and evil in the modern civilizations. And he also took a step further and added a scientific staff to the Vatican, and he opened the archives and the observatories to the general public. Well, not the general public, the people who are doing research. And the Protestant responses to all this modernization, we didn't have anything in the way of doctrine to help us defend our truths. The fundamentalists came to believe in the literal truths of the Bible and no modern ideas. That's They're the group that thinks that... Uh, the world was created 6,000 years ago. And of course, the American pragmatism by Charles Pierce and William James, uh, they seem to believe you could, uh, well, I had a professor once who uh, taught archaeology, anthropology, and religion. He was a also an ordained minister. And I asked him once how he could possibly preach all this or teach all this if he was a minister. And he says, because I feel like God gave me the brain. I'm supposed to use it. I've got free will. So, okay, along you go. So the Americans were still thinking about it. I mean, we, the not the fundamentalists, but the other groups, they tried to incorporate the new changes into their religion, but it was hard. Of course, you've got readers in the popular press. And these new books and new readers are going to facilitate the spread of the new ideas like a Darwinism. And not always the way it should be interpreted either. But you got rising literature rates or literacy rates, and you got new forms of printed mass culture. You've got these what they call dime magazines. Journalism is blending entertainment, sensationalism, and news to increase advertising sales. A man called Alfred Hemsworth was a publisher in Britain, and he said advertising helps lower cost broadening. Okay, cost broadening access to lower income citizens. So back in published by paper with a cheaper rate then more people can buy it. The only problem was that to find all this new mass audience to read my paper, sometimes we're guilty of what we call yellow journalism. Now, yellow journalism is strictly, uh, if it ain't true, that's okay, let's print it anyway. And, and it's, when I was doing my graduate work, I worked at a newspaper in Kentucky 
and I just worked in the evenings and, and on the weekends. And my job was, uh, believe it or not, the obituary clerk, which I had a lot of fun with my name. But even to print an obituary, I had to have three verifications that it was true. One being from the uh, funeral home and another one from the uh, county mortician. And I forget who the third one was for, but I mean, I had to have three verifications that this person had actually died. But if with yellow journalism, you don't have any verification. You just print whatever you hear, in, especially uh, in the Americas. We had problems with this during the Spanish-American War because they would send the uh, correspondents down to Cuba. If they couldn't find anything interesting going on, they'd make it up. And, of course, the public loved sensationalism. It was proven that... Uh, Sensationalism, and I think we have an example of that coming up. Um, no, maybe we don't have it here. Uh, a man that was caught in a rather precarious position demanded more news and paper attention than it did in an election because it was exciting. You didn't know how it was going to end. But the 19th century novel uh, became very focused on modern life and the it began to fuse liberalism and their forces on the individual with romanticism and attention to emotions. And they began to see women being involved. And French writers like Sindal and Balzac and Zola, they began to focus on ordinary people, not just rulers. And women were central to the growth of the novel, both as readers and authors. And for instance, I've got two here. Jane Austen, who wrote Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice, which I think are on the... Uh, public broadcasting channel right now, George Sand, wrote India, Indiana, and uh, Consuelo. Okay, here's Charles Dickens. Critical analysis of the effect of the Industrial Revolution, which we are well familiar with. And he used what we call installments by the penny press to have a growing mass appeal. He just write an installment. Now, when I was very young, we used to go to the movies and we would see uh, part of a, or what we call them serials. You'd see a, a chapter of something happening to Superman or something happening to somebody else, and then you have to come back next week to see the rest of it. Well, this is the Penny Press. You would read part of the story this week, and you'd have to wait till next week and buy next week's paper to read the rest of it. But, of course, the Russian authors were the most respected, like Leo Tolstoy and War and Peace, and if you haven't read that yet, you're in for a trip. It is long, hard to read, it's full of philosophical musings about religion and the fate of peoples and what war does to you and to the land. Anna Karenmana explores debates about Russian reforms and love. Boya Dostoevsky, uh, The House of the Dead, Reflections of Serving Four Years in a Siberian Work Camp for Political Activists. It is very brutal. I did read that one. Brothers Kravinov, Medications on Faith and Religious Doubt. And, of course, there's love and sex in it. What about art? Well, art includes a lot of things, and, and the modern art is going to question the moral and cultural values of the liberal middle-class society. And despite diversity, the modernists shared certain characteristics, a new understanding of the relationship between art and society. W. Kandinsky was an artist who would nourish a human spirit that was threatened by industrial society. Other artists documented what they saw as pathological aspects of modern life. The good, the bad, the ugly. They would plant, paint a house and then show all the trash cans and the hanging clothes on the line. I mean, the bad, I mean they showed exactly the way it was. Politically, the modernists tended toward anti-liberal or revolutionary movements. Modernism defined itself in opposition to the past. And it rejected somewhat the mainstream academic art. They turned their backs on the visual world. And now we begin to focus on subjective, psychologically oriented forms of self-expression. We're getting into expressionism. The French Impressionism was attempted to objectively record natural phenomena and capture the transitory play of light on surfaces. Well, okay. The legacies of Claude Monet and, and Renoir, they're very beautiful paintings. And you've got the post-Impressionism, which is afterwards. you got Chazanne. You've got Van Gogh, and they're exploring art's expressive potential with greater emotion and objectivity. Paul Gauguin. Art is a utopian refuge from the corruption of Europe. The German Expressionism. Emily Noel and Edward Mugt. you got Egon Schlutz, explored sexuality with raw imagery. Matisse and Pablo Picasso. 
Oh, yes, we've got the Cubanists and the Vortex and the Futurists. The ones that are trying to invoke feelings and, and get you to think of, I don't know. When I look at a por painted portrait, I'd like to know what it's saying. I, I don't want it to invoke a feeling that it's going to take me three days to figure out what they're telling me. But that's my own personal viewpoint. I'm sure that some of you really appreciate modern art. You've got the Futuristic Manifesto. It says, we will glorify war, the only true hygiene of the world. Oh, wow. And that's a little deep. Now, before we go any further on the conclusion, I will tell you that I've asked darn few questions about all those names. There's one or two things I've asked, but for the most part, don't sit there and study your poor little heads off about all these different authors and things. I, I, I just, no, it's just too much. But 1870 to 1914 was known as a golden age, and in a lot of ways it was. Major wars had been avoided. Living standards had been improved. The overall spirit of confidence and purpose had improved. We had people living longer. We had children who were healthier. We had more people working. But also it was the age of, shall we say, destabilizing change. Because their relative abundance and rising literacy produced a political climate of rising expectations. Democratic, socialist, feminists are all clamoring for access to mass political politics and revolutions look like they're on the horizon. Scientific and artist, artistic ideas are undermining traditional beliefs of rational liberalism. It's, it's kind of like uh, you can't miss something you've never had, but once you get it op the door open to you and you see what can be had, you want it and you want more. Uh, now, I happened to grow up rather poor in a farm in western Kentucky, and we didn't have television. We didn't, I had a radio I could use a couple of hours a week, but Dad wouldn't let me use any more than that because we didn't want to waste the electricity. Very, very uh, poor. We had money once a year when we turned in the crops, and you had to pay off the bills from last year. Uh, we got three Christmas gifts. One was something we had to have, like a new coat or a new pair of shoes. Um, one was something we had requested, and one was a surprise gift from Santa. Now, this was fine with us because everybody we knew had the same type of thing. Uh, for the first year or two we lived on the farm, we didn't even have running water or inside plumbing. And then we were on a farm. That's the way it was back then. And, but then when we finally moved to a state called New Jersey, where they had not only television, but they were talking about colored television, and there was different types of people around, and I saw TV, and I saw all these toys and things around there that would be available. All of a sudden, I wanted them. Now, as long as I didn't know they were there, I didn't ask for them. I didn't need them. I didn't want them. But now that I knew that they were there, I did want them. So I, even though I was a child at the time, I don't think that my personality was that much different. I think that it's called human nature. Human nature. And that's something that our government fails to take into consideration, especially with liberalism and socialism. You've got to take into consideration human nature. Uh, no two people are alike. There are some people that are so good that they squeak when they walk, and there are some people that they will smile at you and steal your purse. It's called human nature. So it's going to be hard to find a whole community of citizens that are altruistic. That being said, uh, this is the conclusion of this chapter, and believe it or not, in the next chapter we go back into the 18th, 1800s again to learn about imperialism. Good luck, folks. Oh, now that's went the wrong way. This is the way we're supposed to go. This concludes the lecture set for chapter 23. That's what I tried to do and didn't get done.